Coming up on News Center tonight. North Korea fires at least one unidentified projectile toward the east. The regime's second weapon test in just five days. We have the latest. Marking two years in office, President Moon Jae-in will outline his administration's future direction in a live public broadcast, which will be available here on Arirang TV. Officials from South Korea, the U.S. and Japan hold a security meeting in Seoul, with North Korea topping the agenda. And President Trump says China, quote, broke the deal in trade talks between Washington and Beijing, vowing not to back down on imposing new tariffs. New Center begins now. Good evening and welcome to Arirang News Centre, coming to you live from Seoul. I'm Noa Dan. And I'm Han Dan. Thanks for tuning in. We start with a major breaking news. North Korea has fired yet more unidentified projectile less than three hours ago. This comes amid South Korean government's analysis on the projectiles North Korea fired on Saturday. That's right. And let's connect now to Arirang's Defence Ministry correspondent Kim Jian, who's on the line for us. Jian, what are you hearing? Well, South Korea's Joint Chief of Staff confirmed just minutes ago that North Korea had fired two projectiles presumed to be short-range missiles from Kusang region, Pyongyangbukdo province, at 4.29 and 4.49 p.m. local time today in the direction of the EC, with flying altitudes of some 420 kilometers and 270 kilometers each. It was less than a week ago on May 4th when the North fired multiple short-range projectiles, which South Korea and the U.S. are still studying to determine whether they included short-range ballistic missiles. Originally, it was said that the launch site was from Shinori, which is some 200 kilometers north of the inter-Korean demilitarized zone. It's an operational missile base that houses medium-range ballistic missiles like the Dodong-1 and the Pukusung-2. The last time North Korea is known to for sure to have test-fired a missile was in November of 2017 when inter-Korean tensions were high and when President Trump and Kim Jong-un were in a heated verbal exchange. As for last week's projectiles, the launch was confirmed by South Korea's Joint Chiefs of Staff to have involved a new type of tactical guided weapon as well as 240 and 3 100 millimeter multiple rocket launcher systems. The Joint Chiefs and the military is trying to determine whether the weapons were ballistic missiles, considering factors such as their altitudes, but said that there are some obstacles to their identification. The South Korean military was asked whether the projectiles might be short range ballistic missiles, like the Russian Iskander class missile, which can carry nuclear warheads and can invade existing anti missile systems like Patriot or THAAD. The military responded that such a possibility is still under investigation. South Korea's defense ministry had called on North Korea earlier this week to halt actions that raised tensions on the peninsula, saying that although last week's launch did not constitute a violation of the inter-Korean military agreement signed last September, it did go against the spirit of that accord. But as you can see, the regime has dis disregarded that call. There's a lot of questions that aren't being answered by Seoul's defense ministry at this moment moment, including the question, the big question of why North Korea launched again, what is trying to achieve, achieve and the timing, why now? Well, Tsion, we'll have to keep close tabs on what exactly those projectiles are. Now, speaking of timing, trilateral defense talks are also taking place in Seoul. Tell us about that. Right. It could be a mere coincidence or a calculated move by the North. We'll have to see. But officials from South Korea, the U.S., and Japan held defense security talks throughout the day today about military cooperation and regional cooperation, regional security. And it goes without saying that they have been talking and briefed on today's launch. The results of their trilateral meeting was supposed to be released at around 6 p.m. today, but that was pushed back by an hour after the news broke. 
Rogue. There were 11, these were the 11th defense trilateral talks attended by South Korea's Deputy Minister for National Defense Policy, Chung Sok Hwan, and its U.S. and Japanese counterparts, Randall Shriver and Takashi Iskawa. And there was the U.S. State Department's Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Japan and Korean Affairs, Mark Knapper. Prior to the trilateral talks, there have been bilateral talks between U.S. and Japan in the U.S. Embassy in Seoul. Now, Jian, another big question is North Korea's motive, of course, and how this will impact the nuclear talks with South Korea and the U.S. That's right. There are questions about North Korea's motives, whether it wants to send a message to the U.S. or North Korea, uh, and South Korea if it's a show of frustration over their slow progress on sanctions relief. Recently, the North has criticized South Korea for the joint military exercises conducted with the U.S. this year, although they've been scaled down compared to previous years. It also described these launches as part of normal and self-defensive training, arguing that such training is different in nature from war drills. That, in a statement from North Korea's foreign ministry on Wednesday, which also said denying that right to such drills will, will result in consequences that no one wants to see. Other possible reasons for the launch could be for a propaganda, since Kim Jong-un came back empty-handed from the summit with President Trump in Hanoi. We'll have to wait and see if this is a game-changer in denuclearization talks. Back to you. Our Kim Jin at the Defense Ministry first. Thank you. Keep us posted. North Korea's firing of another projectile this afternoon comes while the South Korean government is still figuring out what exactly it was North Korea fired on Saturday. While Pyongyang claims that Saturday's projectile launch was part of its regular self-defensive training, acting U.S. Defense Secretary Patrick Shenahan used the term missiles and rockets when referring to those projectiles. Our Kan Young-woo has this one. North Korea's foreign ministry says its firing of short-range projectiles off its east coast last Saturday was regular self-defensive training. The recent drill conducted by our army is nothing more than part of the regular military training, and it has neither targeted anyone nor led to an aggravation of a situation in the region. The statement released Wednesday appears to be aimed at South Korea after Seoul's defense ministry warned that the military activity went against the intent of the 2018 inter-Korea military agreement and urged Pyongyang to refrain from raising military tensions on the peninsula. The U.S. had been taking a relatively moderate stance on Saturday's firing, with both Secretary of State Mike Pompeo and President Trump saying they're still open to negotiations with Pyongyang. But at a congressional hearing Wednesday, acting U.S. Defense Secretary Patrick Shannon said North Korea had fired rockets and missiles. Seoul's defense ministry, on the other hand, is taking a more cautious stance. It says what exactly was fired has yet to be finally determined. In using the term rockets and missiles, Secretary Shanahan referred to the exact moment of the firing on May 4th when he received initial reports from General Dunford. We understand that Shanahan was not officially speaking about the analysis result of the North's military activity. Seoul's defense ministry says South Korean and U.S. intelligence agencies are currently analyzing what the regime launched. It added the South Korea-U.S. military alliance is always strengthening its monitoring system of the North while continuously developing response measures. Kan Young-woo, Arirang News. Turning now to the nation's top office. Today marks President Moon Jae-in's second anniversary since taking office two years ago. Marking that anniversary, the president is scheduled to hold a TV interview in just about an hour. The first such kind with a local TV broadcaster since taking office. We're expecting issues of all sides to be covered during that one-on-one, -on -one, from foreign policies, the economy, to local politics. For more on that, we go live to our presidential office correspondent, Shin Se-min. Se-min, given the circumstances and the latest development from North Korea, can we expect the president to speak on the North's latest military activity? 
No doubt, Talon. The North Korea's firing of an unidentified projectile just a couple of hours ago looks set to be the center of the interview tonight for President Moon Jae-in, who is marking his second year in office. Now, just a moment ago, we were told by the presidential office that the presidential national security chief, Chung Leung, has spoken with the nation's defense chief as well as the chief of staff via video conferencing. But besides that, no comment or actual reaction coming from the presidential office in regards to the action coming from North Korea. All the more reason the focus is now on what the president has to say about the action today. Now, five days ago, when Pyongyang fired off multiple of its projectiles, South Korea's presidential office remained calm. And instead, the leaders of South Korea, the U.S., spoke over the phone in regards with that issue. In town, today's actions from the regime comes just a day after the Moon administration announced its willingness to provide food aid as a means of humanitarian relief, something the Trump administration had also supported. And that was a move the leaders of South Korea and the U.S. hoped to use as an incentive for the North to return to the negotiating table after that no-deal summit between the leaders of North Korea and the U.S. in Hanoi in February. Well, we definitely have to keep a close eye on what the president says. Um, other than that, what else can we expect from this interview? Now, besides the North Korea-related diplomacy, there are a lot at stake. And just to paint the scene for you, the president has cleared his entire schedule besides that interview, signaling that he is determined to explain his uh, shortcomings and perhaps a lot of the successes that he had seen over the past two years while being in office. And as for other po political and potential topics of discussions, the president could talk about the current economic circumstances the country is facing, not to mention the poor numbers on the jobs front, exports, and consumer sentiment. And for local politics, the rival political parties are locking horns over whether or not to process the reform bills. And there might be some uncomfortable questions given that the entire TV interview is being held and being performed by the actual reporter. Talon? Well, it's a big day for you too, Semin. Thank you for that report. Two years since President Moon took office, and during that time, his major vows include improving people's livelihoods, revitalizing the economy, and boosting inter-Korean relations. His administration has made some progress in those areas, but experts say there is more to do. Her Park Hee-jun has this report. A people-centered economy. The Moon Jae-in administration's economic vision has been credited with improving labor productivity and quality of life through the reduction of working hours and a minimum wage hike. But recent data show unsatisfactory trends in areas including exports and real GDP. During a policy conference Tuesday to evaluate the Moon government's first two years in office, experts raised concerns over such negative economic figures. And the solution they proposed was innovative growth. Income-led growth is a short-term solution that affects the country's potential growth rate. To achieve long-term economic development, the government needs to focus on continuing policies related to technology development and innovative growth. At the center of such policy should be small and mid-sized companies, the backbone of employment and new growth engines. Such advice is in line with President Moon's current economic direction. But not enough is being done, and the government has a long way to go in supporting the business environment of such companies, especially concerning their competitiveness. Starting a company and developing it into a large company is considered the heart of innovative growth. But small and mid-sized companies' productivity only amounts to 30 percent of that of large companies. Smart factories can be the most effective solution to that. And although South Korea is leading in the data industry and with the 5G network, it's falling behind in other areas, mainly artificial intelligence. While the U.S. has more than 1,000 AI companies and Japan over 100, South Korea has just about 40. Experts emphasize the need for drastic measures that can increase the country's competitiveness in fields related to the fourth industrial revolution, which is to be the main source of economic growth from here on. Park Hee-jun, Arirang News. South Korea and the United States have reaffirmed their support for food aid to North Korea, and Seoul has announced its plans to begin reviewing the process of sending the aid. While there are hopes that such an effort could bring the North back to the negotiating table, experts are doubtful. Our EG1 has more. 
The U.S. has said it will not intervene if South Korea decides to provide humanitarian aid to the North. White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders told reporters this on Wednesday, also reiterating that the maximum pressure campaign will continue. U.S. President Donald Trump had also said he supported South Korea's plans to provide aid during his phone call with President Moon Jae-in earlier in the week. A key Blue House official told reporters Wednesday that it is now starting to review the humanitarian food aid to the north. Seoul's Unification Ministry also said that it will proceed with the aid through close coordination with the international community. But it added that it's not yet at a stage to share how much aid will be given or how it will be delivered. With such developments, there are hopes that this could lead to some progress in the current stalemate between Pyongyang and Washington. At the Hanoi summit, North Korea asked for a step-by-step -step negotiation with sanctions alleviation as an early corresponding measure, and the U.S. requested an overall roadmap from the North before any sanctions relief. And recently, the North has said it wants a guarantee of its regime security in exchange for denuclearization. Amid the atmosphere getting increasingly tense due to the North's recent firings of several projectiles, some experts say the humanitarian aid could help soften the mood. It won't directly prompt the North to move, but it is a friendly gesture from the leaders of Seoul and Washington, so it shows their willingness to continue talks as well as setting the atmosphere for it. But some experts say it won't be enough to bring the North back to the negotiating table. The humanitarian aid was already an exemption from the UN sanctions. Providing the North with food assistance is not significant enough to change the North's attitude. The expert, however, added that North Korea previously responded to the food aid with humanitarian inter-Korean exchanges, such as reunions for separated families. Thus, with inter-Korean exchanges at a standstill, the aid may be able to spark something on that front. Lee ji Arirang News. Meanwhile, the government is reviewing the specifics of when and how the food assistance should be given. Alilang's Unification Ministry correspondent, Wo Jung-hee, has more. If South Korea were to deliver food aid directly to North Korea, how much food would Seoul be able to send? According to the Agriculture Ministry, the government has currently 1.3 million tons of spare rice in stock. Excluding the amounts needed for domestic use, watch her say that Seoul would be able to send 300,000 tons of rice to the north. The delivery isn't expected to make much of an impact on the domestic rice market, but rather reduce the cost of storing excess rice. South Korea first provided rice to the north back in 1995. The government sent regular batches, mostly as loans, between 2000 and 2007, when liberal administrations were in office. The last provision was in 2010 to help Pyongyang cope with flood damage. But direct provision of food aid to the north is not the only option on the table. Seoul's food assistance to Pyongyang can be made through the UN's World Food Program. Related discussions are expected to take place next Monday when South Korea's Foreign Minister Kang Kyung-hwa meets with WFP's Executive Director David Beasley. Seoul was ready to send humanitarian aid worth 4.5 million U.S. dollars to the north through the WFP in 2017, but that assistance didn't go through. Seoul's Unification Ministry says what's most important is meeting the most urgent needs of beneficiaries in North Korea, while related government agencies will be reviewing when, how and how much food aid should be given. The government says its top priority is to maximize the effect of the humanitarian assistance. Oh Jung-hee, Arirang News. Turning to local politics now, and Ian Young began his first day as the ruling Democratic Party's new floor leader today by meeting with his counterparts, starting with the floor leader of the main opposition party, Na Gyeong Won. Before the meeting started, he asked for cooperation so lawmakers can get back to work, and he also promised to listen sincerely to the opposition. He also asked for joint efforts to open this month's extraordinary session, which has been delayed due to political wrangling. Na congratulated E on his new post and expressed hope that this will be a chance for the parties to work together for the benefit of the people. This was the first time the floor leaders have met since an intense row that started last month over the fast-tracking of key bills. 
Markets have been rattled this week over tensions between the U.S. and China over trade. With new tariffs looming, talks are set for Thursday. President Trump, meanwhile, is blaming China for breaking a deal they had apparently almost reached. Kim Hyesung with more. U.S. President Donald Trump has accused China of breaking the deal in the ongoing U.S.-China trade talks during a campaign rally in Florida Wednesday. The vice premier tomorrow is flying in. Good man. But they broke the deal. They can't do that. So I just announced it will increase tariffs on China. And we won't back down until China stops cheating our workers and stealing our jobs. Trump threatened to impose additional tariffs on Chinese goods last weekend, accusing China of backtracking on provisions of a draft trade deal. On Wednesday, local time, the U.S. Trade Representative's office filed paperwork to raise tariffs on 200 billion U.S. dollars of Chinese imports to 25 percent from the previous 10 percent, effective this coming Friday. In response, China's Commerce Department said Thursday that Beijing opposes unilaterally imposed tariffs and that it'll take countermeasures if needed. The ministry spokesman Gao Feng said China has the capacity to defend its interests, but it hopes the U.S. can resolve problems through a dialogue. At the same time, a statement from the department said it will on Friday launch a final review of its anti-dumping measures on some steel tubes imported from the United States and the EU, which could result in an extension of existing tariffs on steel. Already, the two sides have exchanged tariffs on over 360 billion U.S. dollars worth of goods in two-way trade since last year. Officials have been locked in negotiations for about five months after Trump agreed to put off the January 1st scheduled increase on tariffs on $200 billion of Chinese goods while talks between the two sides resume. Washington has called on Beijing to make changes to its trade and regulatory practices, including protection over U.S. intellectual property and increased market access to China. As trade tensions escalate, a Chinese delegation led by Vice Premier Liu He will sit down for trade talks with the U.S. delegation on Thursday and Friday local time in Washington. Kim Hyesung, Arirang News. The Bank of Korea says it's going to stick with an accommodative monetary policy stance for the time being. In its monetary policy report for May, the central bank said global trade is slowing down, pointing to the U.S.-China trade war, which hurts local exports and domestic economic growth. South Korea's consumer price inflation for the first quarter was half a percent, well below the BOK's 2 percent target. The Bank of Korea has kept its key rate unchanged at 1.75 percent in its two monetary policy meetings this year and said it will closely monitor the capital markets and geopolitical risks when making any changes to its monetary policy. Yet another data point is out reflecting the slowdown in the Korean economy last quarter. Statistics Korea says the supply of manufactured goods fell by more than 4%, mainly due to less facility investment in semiconductors. Kim Dami has the details. South Korea's total supply and manufacturing dropped 4.1% in the first quarter from a year earlier, another sign of weakening demand in Asia's fourth-largest economy. The Manufacturing Domestic Supply Index, which measures both local and imported goods, marked 98.7 during the January to March period, after increasing by almost 3% in the fourth quarter of 2018. Statistics Korea, who compiled the data, blames the on-year decline on a sharp fall in investment in semiconductor equipment and also noted huge investment in semiconductors in the first quarter last year. Investment in capital goods also dropped by around 23 percent on-year. Capital goods are machines and equipment used for production for more than a year and are another indicator of investment in the manufacturing industry. It's the sharpest fall since the data was first collected in 2010. While the supply of locally made goods fell almost 4 percent, imported products also declined 4.3 percent on-year, mainly due to a decline in imports of mechanical equipment. By industry, local supply in mechanical and transport equipment saw particularly steep drops at 20 and 44 percent, respectively. Kim Dami, Arirang News. 
Call it the miracle of Amsterdam. Son Heung-min and Tottenham Hotspur reached their first Champions League final on Wednesday night thanks to a last gasp comeback in the second leg of their semi-final against Ajax. After conceding two first-half goals, Tottenham looked down and out. But Lucas Moura came to the rescue, scoring a hat-trick, including an injury-time winner. Although Son did not score, the South Korean winger received the second-highest match rating behind Moura. With a stunning win, the London side will face Liverpool in the final on June 1st in Madrid. And Son could become the first South Korean footballer to play in the final since Park ji in 2011. The mayor of Seoul, Park Won-sun, is back from his eight-day trip to Europe and the Middle East. He was not only promoting Seoul as a place to invest, but also looking for innovative ways to improve the lives of the people of Seoul. Er Won Jong-hwan has the story. The key word for this trip was innovative startups. One of the main tasks that Seoul's mayor has on its mind to foster economic growth. Mayor Park Won-sun visited three cities to build partnerships and learn the latest in innovative policies. His first stop was Abu Dhabi, where he worked on a concrete plan for the upcycle landmark scheme, which the two cities agreed to cooperate on last February. The scheme aims to build city-to-city -city partnerships on the issue of environmental sustainability, particularly focusing on fine dust. Park then headed to London, one of the world's main finance hubs, which is home to more than 5,000 financial services companies. His visit came during the city's FinTech Week, a week-long series of events and discussions on finance-related issues such as Brexit, artificial intelligence and investment. Seoul's mayor spoke to more than 100 representatives of financial services corporations in Britain, inviting them to invest in Korea. While laying out his plans to further develop the fintech industry in Seoul's finance hub Yeoido, he proposed funding to help international financial services companies establish branch offices in Seoul. Financial services companies with more than four employees that are able to attract more than 85,000 U.S. dollars of investment can apply for free office space at the hub. For the final stop on his trip, Park visited Israel one of the world's leaders in innovative startup businesses, to have talks with CEOs of global IT venture capital companies such as the Yozma Group. He asked for advice on policy roadmaps to make Seoul a more innovative city, while planning for cooperation between Israeli firms and firms stationed in Seoul. And to help make all this happen, the Seoul Metropolitan Government signed a Memorandum of Understanding with the largest city and financial center of Israel, Tel Aviv, on Monday to better promote friendship and cooperation between the two cities. Through this trip to Abu Dhabi, London and Tel Aviv, Mayor Park hopes to get a better idea on how to tackle the day-to-day -day issues that Seoul's citizens face and improve employment, the environment and, of course, living standards. Wonjuan. Arirang News. Seoul's subway lines are connected to almost every corner of the city and are a good option for foreign tourists to use when choosing where to visit. Our Lee min -sun tells us some good places for foreign visitors to check out. Seoul is full of attractive tourist spots and most of these places are reachable by subway. It's one of the most efficient ways to tour the city. The subway is clean, easy to use, runs frequently, and is relatively cheap. Pampo Hangang Park is just a few minutes walk from Express Bus Terminal Station on Subway Line 3. Seasonal flowers, animals, and riverside scenery make it a great place to take some pictures. Or visitors can walk, run, or cycle along the river. They can also rent a tent to relax and have food delivered. Moving a couple of subway stops north, Apgujang Station on Line 3 or the Apgujang Rodeo Station on the Bundang Line is a must-visit spot for K-pop lovers. Along with many luxury shops, specially made dolls called Gangnam Door are on display along the street named K-Star Road. Fans can walk around to find the dolls that represent their favorite K-pop groups like BTS, Girls' Generation or EXO. So we came here for the K-pop Star Road. 
because we like K-pop. <laughs> yes. And we just wanted to see the dolls and see the place. The SM building. Yeah. <laughs> because, uh, well, I like EXO and I like, I love NCT as well. <laughs> Um, yeah, we, we like K-pop. <laughs> and we just want to take pictures. We just expect to have a good time. The weather is so nice. Gangnam District is the leading place for spotting the latest Korean trends and is the home of many Korean stars. This neighborhood is packed with entertainment companies like SM and FNC Entertainment, and celebrities often shop here. If visitors are lucky, they might bump into an actual K-pop star. Across the river near Anguk Station on Line 3, there are well-known places like Royal Palaces and Bukchon Hanok Village. Roughly a 10-minute walk from the Hanok Village is the Blue House, Korea's presidential office. To tour inside, visitors must make an online reservation, but even without a reservation, you can go to the water fountain in front of the Blue House and take pictures. Since 2017, the walking trail from the fountain to the other end of the Blue House has been open to the public, giving tourists a chance to take a peek at Korea's top office. Im min Sun, Arirang News. Seoul's Trade Minister Yoo Myung-hee is going to Washington next week to urge the Trump administration to not levy tariffs on Korean cars. The U.S. government is reviewing hefty new tariffs on auto imports, citing threats to national security. President Trump is due to make a final decision by the end of next week. Minister Yoo has said Korea should be exempt from those tariffs because they would violate the two countries' free trade pact. The number of women working full-time at public institutions rose nearly 10% last year compared to 2017. A local job portal which compiled the data says the rise for women was three times that for men. However, the total number of men at public institutions was nearly twice as high and men were also still being paid more than women. South Korea's human rights watchdog says cross-dressing Korea's traditional attire, hanbok, should also qualify for free admission to palaces. Currently, visitors can tour palaces in downtown Seoul for free as long as they come wearing hanbok according to their biological sex. The government says this rule upholds the tradition of wearing hanbok the right way. Some civil groups disagree, saying this dress code discriminates against those who wish to cross-dress. The National Human Rights Commission of Korea has urged the government to revise the rule. People visiting local museums and art galleries from tomorrow can enjoy discounts or free admission. It's part of the Culture Ministry's Museum Week, which will run until May 19th. Over 400 museums and art galleries will be taking part, including the National Museum of Korea, which will also host various cultural events. More details are available on the Korea Museum Association's website, but please note the information is in Korean only. That has been your three-minute news flash. It was warm and breezy here in Seoul today. Yes, and it's been like that for the past few days. And even the eastern provinces saw even hotter weather. To see if this will continue, let's turn to our Michelle Park at the Weather Center. Michelle. Good evening, guys. Many areas had warm and pleasant weather, but a strong wind advisory has been issued for Kaunda province. And dry weather alerts have also been issued for most parts of the country. The dry conditions will intensify as the nation can expect only partly cloudy skies tomorrow and surrounding countries such as Beijing and Tokyo will see similar weather conditions. And temperatures are higher than seasonal norms tomorrow and Seoul, Daegu and Gwangju will start off to 12 degrees Celsius in the morning while Chuncheon and Gyeongju will linger in the single digit readings. The day will warm up. Now, Seoul can expect more than 10 degree jump to reach up to 26 degrees, but temperatures will be lower for Busan and Jeju. More sunny spells are expected over the upcoming days with hotter conditions over this weekend. I'll leave you with weather conditions around the world.
That will wrap it up for this edition of Arirang News. Thank you, as always, for watching. Stay tuned to Arirang for more analysis on North Korea's latest firing of projectiles. A news in-depth coming up next.